Morning, everyone. I trust that you're well. Um, welcome to our online session this morning. I trust that you're all well and excited to learn this morning. Um, I hope that you have your learning manuals in front of you. Um, and please, um, you're more than welcome to make your own notes on it. Um, and of course, um, questions are welcome throughout the session. So please make sure that you um, raise your questions or raise your hand. And of course, we would like this session to be very interactive. So I'd like to hear from you as well. So um, I'll just be turning off my camera now to reduce the cognitive load. Um, so, but I am here, so don't worry. Um, so please make use of um, the chat or raise your hand to ask a question. Thank you. So moving on, um, this is the book that everyone should have in front of them, and I'm sure that you have it now. by now. Um, our session today will be starting off with the concepts, and um, it is very important for us to understand the um, various concepts that we, that we have to face with each topic. Um, so for paper one, we are dealing with macroeconomics, the work that you basically done in term one. Um, so macroeconomics will be tested in your trial exam now in September, as well as um, at the end of the year. And um, this is all term one's topics and macroeconomics consists out of four um, topics, which is the circular flow, business cycles, and international trade or foreign exchange market. So the booklet has been set up in a manner that each topic is different and not each topic is different, each topic is separate. So um, we are going to do topic by topic and that is of, and this is of course going to help you um, at the end of the year, section A, section B, the concepts that you need to know and understand. Um, so, they tell us here to fully understand the concepts. You will need to know the economics terminology for each topic. Um, the top, the following table will assist you in the learn in learning the concepts, which will enable you to understand the content and the questions, um, and answer them successfully. Of course, so very important. Whenever you study, um, the concepts, of course, is one of the main things. So this first part is circular flow. So we have about 14 questions re relating or 14 concepts relating to the topic circular flow. And I'm going to give you about um, eight minutes where you can read through it. Um, and this question normally comes in question 1.3 in the exams, um, where they give you the concept or the, uh, sorry, where they give you the description and they expect the concept back. So at the end of the day, it is um, similar to um, what you would get in a section A. And of course, section B as well, they also ask you various concepts. So here's about 14 questions on your page. And um, I, would like you, I would give you about eight to 10 minutes to work through it. If you have notes in front of you or your style, your notes from classroom, you're more than welcome to use it. Um, and of course, if you have any questions, you are more than welcome to also ask. But I'm going to give you about um, 10 minutes to go over to read through the concepts, and then we're going to compare our answers. And of course, I'm going to also ask you to give your answer before I share mine.
I hope that we are all still um, going good um, through the concepts. I'm still giving you another four minutes to read through the concepts and then we will go through it together. Um, of course, you're more than welcome to make your own notes. I like um, key concepts and I'll also show it to you when I'll explain it now as well. Right, so the first concept that they give us here um, is the spending that consumers must make even though they have no disposable income or the consumption spending that occurs when income levels are zero. So firstly, um, does anyone have an answer for us here for this particular um, description? See, I'm done, is there anyone that um, they haven't answered yet? Not yet, ma'am. Not yet, ma'am. Oh, okay. So, this concept has to do with autonomous consumption, or is known as con autonomous consumption, because even though you do not have any disposable income available, you will still have to spend. So what is disposable income? Disposable income is basically the money that you have left over after all your bills are paid. Um, so then you will still spend automatically at the end of the day. The second concept they give us here is that um, a year with very small price changes or, fluctu or price fluctuations the current base year used um, by the Reserve Bank is currently um, 2015. Um, does anyone have an answer for this one? 
before I share my answer? Um, please post your answers in the chat. It's going to make it very really easier. Um, if you do not want to speak um, by the mic, because I would like everyone to be um, interactive throughout the session, please. So, um, this concept or description um, is known as the base year, and they basically give it to you here where they say the current base year is um, used by the Reserve Bank is 2015. So, um, if you have a highlighter or pen or pencil, you could maybe highlight that as well, and that's going to make it easier for you um, going forward when you need to study for um, your prelims and end of the year. The third concept that they give us here is um, used when calculating GDP according to the production method, and it represents the production cost of firms. Um, does anyone have an answer for us here? Or number So, this is known as your basic prices. So, remember there are three methods to calculate GDP. We have the reduction method, income method, and the spending method. Um, so, firms need to use basic prices um, in order to get to the production of goods and services. Concept number four, or the fourth description, Long-term funds are borrowed and saved by consumers and businesses, business enterprises. The market for long-term financial instruments, for example, bonds and shares. So just think about it when you need to go and save your money or you need to go and borrow money or invest money, where would you go? Um, of course, you would go to the capital market to go and um, save your money there or go and borrow from there because remember in economics capital um, relates to um, the money that you use to for investment purposes. Number five, this concept has to do with um, or says a, continu a continuous flow of spending production and income between different sectors. So um, what do you think this is? So what concept do you have here? Um, is there any school with um, a, a answer, um, CM Tanda, or if not, then I'm going to start asking schools um, for the answer, please. Not yet, ma'am. Okay. Please post um, your answers in the chat, teachers. Um, please ask the learners um, to post the answer there as well, so that... Um, I don't have to speak alone in the session because I would like your interaction, please. So, number five, I, um, that has to do with the circular flow. Um, because it's basically, it shows how spending, production, and income um, takes place between our various sectors, uh, businesses, uh, households, and of course, the uh, markets that we have, factor market, goods market. 
Then number six, an economy that has no foreign sector as a participator or participant. So this ties in with number five. Remember, we have our various sectors, um, government, households, businesses, and then the foreign sector. But now we exclude the foreign sector as a participant. And that brings us to a... closed economy because we are just dealing with in the um more within the country so we do not um, allow trade to take place then number seven total spending on final goods and services by individuals and households are known as um private consumption expenditure number when the national content adds up to, to, to the total expenditure for the four major sectors and here we've got C plus G plus I plus X minus M. Remember C is your consumption, G is your government expenditure, I is your investment and then X minus M that is your net um, exports and imports. Um, then that is known as your expenditure method and remember I said previously when we were to dealing with concept number three that we have three methods to calculate GDP and I mentioned that we have our um, income production and expenditure method and to derive our GDP we need to make use of these variables in order to work out our GDP for the country. Number nine, goods and services produced locally and sold for the consumption outside of the borders of the country, and that is exports. So basically, we produce wines here in our country, and then we would sell it into the international market, the way they do not have wine available. Um, and then, of course, we would receive an income in return for doing that, and that is going to um, help our economy to stimulate. Then in the market where factors of production are traded, for example, labor market. So on our circular flow model, or model, we have two markets. We've got the goods and services market and we've got the factor market. So goods and services, that is where we will get your final goods and services that is um, ready for consumption. And then your um, factor market, that is of course where you get your various factors of production to use to produce those goods and services that you later on will uh, make available to the goods and services market. Then number 11, the cost or the price paid by um, the cost or the price paid for factors of production, they, they give you the factors of production, which is land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship used by firms. So basically, what do they get in return for um, offering up the factors of production? So they get a factor income. Just think of it, salaries and wages, um, if you offer up your labor. Um, yeah. Then number 12 ties in with, um, ties in, was number four, where we number four we see that was capital market, and number twelve, it sounds the same, but it's two different things. So yeah, they say the market where both short term and long term assets are traded, financial assets are traded. Yeah, by number four they said um, it's a market, a long term market or long term funds are saved and borrowed, and yeah, by number twelve. The, the market where both short-term and long-term financial assets are traded. So that would be your financial market. Just think of it as the JSE. Then number 13. Now I'm lying. Number 12 is just the financial market. Number 13 is the financial sector because that is where the JSE will come in. So you need to know and understand the difference between the two. So number 13, these, oh sorry, those financial 
institutions that are not directly involved in the production of goods and services, for example, banks. When you go to the bank, the bank doesn't produce um, the products that the business sells, but the bank is essential because the bank is a link between the business and the economy. Insurance companies, pension funds, and JSE, where we trade our shares. So that is a financial sector. So it is important for you to understand the difference between the two of them financial sector and the financial market. Then the last concept for this, for the circular flow, would be the market in which one currency can be traded for another. For example, we would like to trade the rand for a dollar. So this is the market that you'll use when you go and travel or we go to other country where you need to pay in the particular um, currency. Or, my, or this is also the market that you'll use when you import and export. So does anyone have an answer for us for number 14, please? So number 14 would be your foreign exchange market. So now we have done the first part or the first topic under macroeconomics, and that is, of course, um, the circular flow model. So we are going to move on to the next topic, and we're going to do exactly the same. We're going to give you time to read through the, the descriptions and then, of course, give your answer um, so that you... On to, so that you can understand the descriptions much better. And of course, you're more than welcome to post your um, questions in the chat. And then the register was also posted in the chat. So please um, complete it as well. Apologies, um, your by description they on your notes, they do not tell you that this is business cycle. So can you please write here next door or next to the description um business cycles and then of course read through the read through the description and then you also um write out your particular answer.
um, the meeting is not freezing. I gave um, the learners an opportunity to read through the um, description um, so before we compare our answers. So um, I'll start now in the next two minutes with the explaining. So the meeting is not freezing. Right. So, um, number one, they ask you here, yeah, the description is, refers to the vertical height difference between a trough and the next peak of a cycle. The greater the difference, the more extreme the changes that occur. So, does any school have an answer to this um, particular description, please? Please post it um, in the chat. Thank you so much, Balhai. It's an amplitude. Um, number two, um, the period immediately before and through the upper turning point of the cycle. Please post your answer in the chat so that, so that we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much for number one for Santa Claus. Is an amplitude, yes. We are busy now with number two. And number two is the period immediately before and through the upper turning point of the cycle. So um, before we get to the turning point, remember the Turning point, the highest point is the peak. Before we get to the peak, what do we call that? Thank you, Balai. That is a boom, and you're correct. Um, other, the other schools, um, we'd also like to acknowledge you, so please make use of the chat as well. Um, number three, um, successive periods of growth and decline in economic activities. What is this particular concept or description? Right, so that is the basic definition of the business cycles. And for those of you um, that are not aware yet, we are currently doing the second topic under macroeconomics, which is business cycles. Um, so we are just going through the concepts since we are comparing basically our answers. Um, so that's number three. Number four, 
This moves at the same time as the economy moves. This also indicates the actual state of the economy. So, um, any suggestions to what that is, please post your answer um, in the chat. So I'll give you a clue and we are working with some sort of indicator. Yes, you are correct. Balhai, it seems like Balhai is um, it's on it with the answers. Thank you so much. It's a coincidental indicator. Um, number five, this is a grouping of various indicators of the same type into a single value. The single figure forms a norm for a country's economic performance. And I'll give you another clue that is also, it also has to do with indicators. Yes, Bahai, thank you so much. Composite indicator. Then number six. Thank you, Craven B. You're correct. Um, number six. Economic activity at its lowest, deepening of recession. So basically, what comes after a recession when the economy is very, very bad? Thank you so much, Bahai. It's a depression. Number seven, a period where there is a general increase in economic activity. So this is, of course, the opposite to number six. Number six is where we are depressed, we feel bad, we are doing bad as an economy. But number seven uh, is quite the opposite. Yeah, we start to feel uh, uh, much better, or not feel better, but I mean, as an economy, we are doing much better. Um, we are leading, or we are recovering, we are in a phase of when things are always good in your life, a prosperity phase. Um, number eight, used to measure trends in the economy and for, and for example, GDP. So GDP is something we use to see as they can, as the economy um, increased or decreased, shrunk and so forth. Um, and that is known as what? It is also, it also has to do with some sort of indicator, but what type of indicator? Thank you, Bawai. We see your answers. So number eight, we are still waiting on number eight. So we said that is a it is used to measure trends in the economy, and they give you an example there, GDP. And I gave you a clue. I said it's some sort of indicator. So no one is giving an answer, so um, I guess I have to share mine. So number eight would be economic indicator. Number nine holds the view that markets are inherently unstable. Therefore, government intervention may be required. And then I'm also going to do number 10 simultaneously. So I, I just want to show you something as well relating to that. Um, so... Uh, believes that the markets are inherently stable and disequilibrium causes um, by incorrect use of policies, for example, monetary policies. So both has to do with some sort of reason. That is my clue or approach, sorry, approach. So there are two approaches that you could use. Yes, the first one, um, number nine, is endogenous approach. Thank you, Valo. So number 10 would be number 10 
number 10. So we already got number 9 from Bahá'í. Thank you so much. Number 9, we uh, said holds a view that markets are inherently unstable. Number 10, markets uh, believe that markets are inherently stable. So the answer for number 9 was endogenous. And now number 10 would be the opposite, which is exogenous. So I just went to go back to my resources. I can show you a method to, to remember this um, concept. So this is what you have done in grade 10. And this um, basically um, would assist you. So it's maybe something that you could also note. So here's your here's a, a acronym that you could um, use here, mixes. So it, it markets, sorry, it refers to the monetarist approach. And then um, it says here exogenous factors. So this is factors that we cannot control. Um, and this, of course, would give us reasons for expansions or contractions for the economy to take place. For example, the oil price, that would be an exogenous factor because we cannot control it. Um, and then the tellers here, monetarists believe that Markets are relatively stable. And then if you look here, there is a visual um, figure there for you. It's basically there they give you the name of the person mixes. And this person is now solid and it's stable. And then we get um, endogenous, which was on number nine's um, answer. So this is a... Um, Kino is the person's name, and the earth says he's a very thin guy and he's unstable. And it also says here that was the Keynesian approach. Endogenous, these are factors within the country that um, gives reason for expansion and contraction to take place. And it also believes that the markets are um, unstable. So this is one method that you could use to study at the end of the year, because remember, this might be concepts, but these concepts um, is will help you to um, answer questions where they could ask you maybe comp, um, differentiate between uh, exogenous and endogenous. So then you can just use this acronym to your disposal, um, or they could even ask you eight more questions relating to this. Um, um, explain the endogenous or exogenous reasons for business cycles. So this is something that you can use in your studies. And this um, comes from, from your grade 10 notes. So um, you have been exposed to it. It's something that you know, just something that you might forgot um, over the years. So I'm going to leave it quickly a minute for those of you that would like to take notes from it. Um, so I'll just leave it a minute quickly. So then you can just take a picture or you can even um, make your notes quickly. Right, moving on. So we are busy with number 11. And number 11's concept. Sorry, um, what was not clear about her? Oh, what, um, could you please tell us what is not clear? Is it the picture that's not clear or what? Okay, I'll be I'll zoom in a bit. And so far it's only Baha that have and Craven B and then here's a school in Kowesi secondary. I hope I'm pronouncing your school correctly. Thank you for your interaction. I do appreciate it. Um, the other schools, I would like you to also interact as well. Uh, 
track. I'll be moving on now to number 11. And number 11 means to estimate something unknown from facts that are known. For example, expropriations from known facts are used to predict the future share prices. So what concept would um, this be for number 11? And they basically give it to you. They basically give it to you here in the in the question. So does anyone know that? Oh, sorry, I have the answer to that. Here they give you the answer. I'm sure that was an error to give you the answers. So do you see how important it is? You you need to read, and sometimes with you reading, thank you, Krembi. With you reading, you will get the answer in the, in the thing, in the description. Number 12, used to analyze the changes in a series of data over a certain period of time. And unfortunately, they do not give you the answer here. So it is used to analyze the changes in a series of data over a certain time, moving averages. Thank you, Bala. Hi. Number 13, a policy using taxation and government spending implemented by the National Treasury. And this is a easy one, I would say. A policy that uses taxation and government spending implemented by the National Treasury and Balha is on it again and Balha's answer is fiscal policy and they are correct. Thank you so much. Then from number 14, 15, 16 and 17, um, that has to do with the various types of cycles that you get. And the number 14 here, they ask you here, loss from 7 to 11 years and it is caused by the changes in um, Changes in net investments by government and businesses. And Andrews gave us an answer, juggler cycles. And St. Andrews is correct. Thank you so much. Number 15, the cycle lasts between three to five years, and it is caused by adjustments of inventory levels in business cycles. Kitchen, um, St. Andrews is, and St. Andrew is correct. Kitchen cycles. Number 16, this particular cycle lasts longer than 50 years and it is caused by technological innovations, wars and discoveries of new deposits of resources, for example, gold. gold. Any guess to what type of cycle we are working with? So we already said number 14 was juggler, number 15 is your kitchen cycle and the number 16. Any guess to number 16? If not, I'm going to leave it. Uh, there we go. Thank you, St. Andrews. Conductive cycles. Um, and then number 17, this particular, this particular cycle lasts between 15 to 20 years and is caused by changes in activity in the building and construction cycle. And that is your... Thank you, St. Andrews. You're on a roll. Um, Kuznet cycles. That's correct. So how would one study that? Of course, you need to study the particular years. So I give you for each one. That is a keyword, the years. And then, of course, you must also know by what it is called. So, the, so that is your keywords that you need to look out for when you study. Number 18 will not change direction until and will not change direction until after the business cycle has changed its its direction. For examples, um, indicators are hours worked in construction and that is 
lagging. Thank you so much, Robin, uh, Robinville. I hope I'm pronouncing the school correct. Um, Bahal as well. Thank you. Um, and the key word is will not change. Will not change. That is your key word that you must look at. So then, number 19, gives consumers, businesses, and the state a glimpse of the direction in which the economy might be heading. For example, um, leading indicators are job um, advertising space, inventory, and sales. And they, again, give you the answer in the question. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing the school correct in... Kowezi secondary. I hope I'm pronouncing your school correct. You're correct. Um, and yeah, that's the only answer that I have so far. And that's the correct answer that is leading indicators. Then number 20. It is measured from a peak to a peak or a trough to a trough. Longer cycles show strength and shorter cycles shows weak. Weaknesses regarding economic activities, and that is the length. Thank you, Balai. So now we have gone through to, uh, the second topic under um, macroeconomics. Now we can move on to the third topic. So the third topic has to do with public sector. Um, so I'm going to do the same that I've been doing for all for both topics so far. I'm going to give you about ten minutes to read through it. And then, of course, we can um, compare our answers as well, like we did just now. And thank you so much for your interaction.
Right, I'll copy um, the answers in the next two minutes. Um, just so the teachers, um, that's currently in the venues. Um, can you just, um, the register has been posted in the chat. Could you just uh, pull it out, please? The attendance register, thank you. Right, public one of the most relatable um, topics because it just happened uh, um, on Sunday. We had our recent cabinet announcement, so I'm sure if you followed the news that some of you will be able to relate as well. So the first uh, um, description is um, public officials are required to explain their decisions and actions. Thank you, Bao Hai. Accountability, Robin Bao Hai, St. Andrews, hi. Or secondary, accountability, you're all correct. Thank you. Number two, a plan, a document, a document detailing ex expected revenue and projected expenditure. And that is a budget. Thank you for Santa Claus. We see accountability. Um, that is a budget for number two. Thank you, Bao Hai, St. Andrews, secondary, um, Robin Bell, national budget. Yes, that's correct for Santa Crow. Um, that's correct. Then, number three, um, teachers, when you post your answers in the chat, could you number it as well? Because then that's going to make it easier. Um, number three, an indirect tax on goods and services consumed in the economy, and most of you have already um, mentioned it, um, and that is value-added tax, or also known as VAT. So thank you, St. Andrews, Robin Vale, hi, Bao, hi, uh, for Santa Cal, hi, um, in Kowesi, hi, I hope that I'm pronouncing your school correct. Um, yeah, so we are still busy with number three. Number four, an official in a government department. And um, that is known as a... It's an Andrew said civil servant. Um, civil, civil, civil servant, I would say is acceptable, but the correct term would be a bureaucrat. Then number five, the removal of unnecessary legal restrictions. And St. Andrews has said that that is deregulation. And they are correct. Thank you for your answer, um, in Kowesi. Secondary. So number five is deregulation. So it's basically where we remove unnecessary laws, and this and this took place, um, especially during 2021, where we had certain lockdown levels. So we were regulated, and they say um, you are now permitted to do this and that and that, and that means it was deregulated. Number six. Taxes that are not passed on to the end user, for example, pay, uh, pay, pay or pay as you earn, um, and that would be direct 
text. Thank you, St. Andrew. We see your answer. Number six is direct text or taxes. Number seven, government officials provide the public with goods and services promptly and in the desired quantity and quality. Any answer? I just see so far, and Andrews has said for number seven, public services. Um, any other school with an answer? So number seven is efficient provision. Number eight, examples is your police stations. Everyone can use um, these, whether you're willing to pay for it or not. And what would that be? Number eight. Number eight, everyone can use it whether you're willing to pay for it or not. And either give you the, the example would be the police station. We are still by number eight. I do see all the other answers, but I'm just waiting on number eight. Um, St. Andrews had said that that is uh, a public good. For number eight, any other answer? May for Santa Claus is on it. So with all the answers, we will get to it. I love all the answers that I'll be receiving from all of you. Um, number eight is a community good. And thank you, St. Andrews, community good. So basically, everyone can access it, irrespective of whether you're going to pay for this or not. Number nine, tax levied on the sale of goods and services. So this ties into something that we have done earlier on here. Um, I think that was question number three. It ties into that, and that would be indirect taxes. Right. Oh, the competition is tough in the chat. I like it. Number 10. Uh, goods provided for the society as a whole, for example, parks and public utilities, the provision of these goods give rise to the free rider problem. Um, so number 10, let's see what are your answers. For Santa Claus is public goods and services. That's all I see for number 10 so far. Uh, as an Andrew says, made it good for number 10. Um, in Coway Seas's secondary says recreational centers. Um, but that is known as your collective goods. So number eight, the difference between number eight and number 10. Number eight, everyone can use it. There is no restriction to it. Number 10. Uh, that is um, good provide, provided for the society as a whole. So that is collective. So that's the difference between the two. Yeah, they said the provision of these goods will give rise um, to the free rider problem because here by number eight, you don't need to pay to go to the police station. But here by number 10, you might need to pay to access a certain park or public facility. Um, so that is the difference between the two that you must keep in mind. Number 11 uh, shows the relationship between tax rates and uh, income tax. And I saw the answer earlier on, so I just need to scroll down quickly. Number 11 for Santa Claus says Laffer Curve, and they're correct. Uh, St. Andrews also Laffer Curve. And then Inco Wessizi also says the Laffer Curve. You are correct so far, and thank you. Number 12, the government policy 
statement outlining its three-year budget. And number 13 says estimates income and expenditure for a three-year period. So the number 12 answer, let's see, um, was the school said got it correct? So number 12, I'm reading both. Um, 11, uh, sorry, 12 and 13 together because it, rela it relates. Number 12, um, for Santa Claus says medium term budget framework. Um, so Andrew says medium term expenditure framework. And that's all the answers that I have for number 12 so far. We're um, all the other schools, you are more you're most welcome to um, post it, your answer for number 12 as well, before I share my answer. All right, so number 12, the government statement. So that is already a keyword statement that we need to look at, the statement setting out this three-year uh, budget. So number 12's answer would be medium-term budget policy statement. So you see that that is where the keyword comes in. Um, then number 13 says estimates income and expenditure for a three-year period. So here by number 12, we are already setting out this is what we want to spend. Um, but might sound the same, but it's actually not. And then by number 13, we estimate um, for the three-year period. So number 13 is your medium-term expenditure framework. So basically, we this normally happens in October, I would say. Um, and then we look at what we spent so far and then where we could reallocate our money. And this also, a good example of this would be during COVID when um, they had to re-divert certain funds from one department for the next department in, to ensure that the economy is moving. Then, number 14, goods and services whose provision has benefits for the uh, user, private and for the society, for example, um, healthcare, education, etc. So, let's look at the answers quickly because I saw a few answers already. So for Santa Claus said for number 14, merit goods, you're correct. Um, I see um, Buren also said merit goods. Um, number 14 is not the reserve bank. Um, I see there you corrected. Yeah, so um, it is merit goods. So basically, if you think of healthcare, um, and education, they basically give that so that uh, people could, um, it's basically something positive for the people. Then number 15 decides on the country's monetary policy. And I think that is where um, most people said the monetary Policy Committee, that's the answer. Yes, the Monetary Policy Committee works within the Reserve Bank. So that's why most people gave here the Reserve Bank as an answer. But the Monetary Policy Committee, um, they decide on the country's monetary policy, where they would say that the inflation targeting range is set at 3 to 6%, um, and so forth. And they're the people that would meet up regularly on every second month, and then they will decide what we are going to implement now. What are we going to um are we going to increase our interest rates based on what's happening in the economy, or we're we going to decrease it, or we're we going to um keep it the same. So that is number 15, and that would be your monetary policy committee. Number 16. Yeah, they say it is concerned with national issues, for example, safety and security. And who is that particular person? And I earlier on when I started with this topic, I said we had um, a good example of this that took place, and that was Sunday. Um, so number 16, we go back here for Santa Corral. 
Santa Claus says National Army Police um, Department of Defense. That's for number 16. That's all answered I see. Um, Inkle says key issues. Just think about it on Sunday. Who addressed the nation and who is that person that was, of course, the president? And the president um, basically um, represents national or central government. So the answer for number um, 16 has to do with national or central government. Doesn't matter which one you say, both is correct. Number 17, you transfer the functions of transfer functions and ownership of entities, entities would be your businesses, from the private sector to the public sector. So all the companies that used to work in the public sector will now be part of the, um, sorry, all the sectors that was part of the private sector will now be part of the public sector. And that is known as, I'm looking at the answers quickly. St. Andrews, I see a nationalization, Bureau nationalization. Um, the Santa Crow, I see you say a nationalism. Um, and that's all answers that I have so far. So the answer is nationalization and thank you. Number 18, it is harmful to the community, for example, cigarettes, and most of you got it correct and all done. It's demerit goods. It's goods that we're not supposed to use, and the government charges um, us high levels of VAT on it to discourage us from, of course, buying that particular um, good. Number 19, government officials fail to deliver services to the public because of bureaucracy, incompetence, and corruption. So what would we say that is for number 19? Um, bureaucracy is public sector failure. And Andrews is government failure. Go is easy. Secondary also says public sector failure. It's acceptable, yes. And thank you. Right, number 20. Provided by the state for the use of for the use by all members of society, for example, public libraries. And that is someone said it earlier on here, uh, Buren Public Goods. And services, you are correct. That is the answer. Public goods. St. Andrews also said public goods. You are correct. Right. So now we're moving on to the last um, topic under um macroeconomics and that is in the uh, foreign exchange market so i'm going to do exactly the same um we i give you about 10 minutes to read over the concepts and then we will compare our answers as well and to the teachers in the classroom please um fill out the attendance register so far so I'll give you about 10 minutes. So at quarter two, it's now 25 to quarter two. We will compare our answers as well. Thank you so much for the interaction. I do appreciate it.
I see the aunt is flooding in. We'll compare the answers now just to the teachers. Um, could you just number it so it's going to make it easier um, when you, um, giving your school the recognition for giving the answers? So could you just number it, please? Thank you.
that there's competition in the chat and I like it. So I don't even know where to begin, but okay, we'll I'll get back to that. Um, so thank you so much for your contributions, firstly. Um, then secondly, before I now um, compare our answers to the learners, um, it is very important that I've, I've been giving you 10 minute reading time from um, all the topics to read because um, this is also going to be a, a good tip for the exam because to read basically because oh the nerves sorry um, but in any case let's just compare our answers quickly so um, number one where one country can produce um, goods or services cheaper than the other and Craven B gave the first answer so well done comparative advantage in Kuluizizi secondary um, as well said comparative advantage Buren comparative advantage um, yeah so so far you're all correct I just want to make sure that I'm not missing anyone out for Santa Claus comparative advantage thank you so much and well done uh, moving on to number two, an increase in the country, an increase in the price of one country's currency in, in the terms, or sorry, in terms of another country's currency due to market forces. And um, you're correct in saying appreciation. And the key word there, I would say, is increase. So that is that you, something that you could highlight in terms of studying and remember all of these terminologies that we are doing currently they are going to ask it in paper one for your trial exam september and they're most definitely going to ask it at the end of the year so that's why it's much easier to break it up topic by topic so that um, the way your notes are now prepared so at the end of the year when you of course study you use this also as study material so number three these are exchange rates, exchange rates um, which are allowed to respond to market forces within certain limits. And the answers that I got is manage um, exchange rate um, from Buren um, and Andrews as well, manage exchange rate. Um, that is for number. Three so far, I'm just moving on to see. Um, for Santa Claus as well, manage exchange rate. Um, yeah, so that's all. Thank you so much. So number four, systematic record of transactions between one country and other countries, for example, South Africa and all other countries in the world. So basically, um, it's basically we're keeping track of who we are recording with the imports and the exports and that is known as balance of payments which most of you have mentioned pure and i um balance of payments it's an andrews balance of payments in cc secondary balance of payments um is moving on so that I do not forget anyone here because i'd like to acknowledge all the schools that is participating in this um for Santa Claus balance of payments um yeah that's all so thank you and it means that you are moving in the right direction you know your work so far well done number five determines the relative values of different of different currencies and enables the conversion of currency to facilitate international trade. And most of you got that right as well. And that is exchange rate. Thank you, Craven B. We see you, St. Andrews, exchange rate. Um, Buren I, we see you, the exchange rate. Just moving on to see who else um, we should acknowledge. The Santa Claus exchange rate, well done. And that's also four. So that's number five. Number six, it number six is a decrease. So number two was an increase. So that was appreciation. So a decrease is a depreciation in the price 
of the country's currency um, in terms of another country's currency due to market forces. So that is depreciation. So let's just acknowledge who got it right so far. Um, Buren, Raven B, St. Andrews, Santa Crow, yeah. So thank you to those schools. Moving on to number seven, the deliberate decrease. So that is your keyword, deliberate decrease in the value of the currency in terms of another uh, currency. And your answers that you gave so far, you just go to your answers. Is devaluation and you are correct so far. And that is an Andrews, uh, Buren, Nkuluisizi. And for Santa Crow, I don't want to miss anyone out. That's why I'm taking my time to acknowledge you because you took time to um, pop us an answer in the chat. So well done to you. Number eight, includes transactions relating to investments, for example, investments in businesses. So let's see what you have so far. Number eight. Some people say financial account for number eight. Um, it is direct investments. Number eight is direct investments. Number nine, an investment made in a specific asset with a future payout value of a specific date. So let's just see what is your answers here. No one. Number nine says a Buren says a bond. St. Andrew says financial derivative. Craven B also says financial derivative. Right. And the answer to number um, nine is financial derivative. So well done to those schools. Number 10, um, international investment transactions by South Africans in other countries by foreigners in South Africa are recorded in where? So just think about it. When we, sorry, just moving down. So when South Africans, basically, they're in the other country and they now, this money needs to be recorded. And in foreigners also, they're in this country. We would we record this in our balance of payment? And that would be under our financial account. So let's see who got that correct so far, Craven B. Craven B, I think you're the only one that got that one correct so far. I'm just double checking, so I do not... Um, Skip anyone. So well done to Craven B for getting it correct. Number 11, the value of exports minus imports. Let's see what your answers are. And number 11, um, it is not the IMF International Monetary Fund. Um, St. Andrew says for number 11, net exports. And that uh, that's the only answer that I have so far. Um, but the answer is trade balance. Number 12, international an international organization that lends money to countries with the ongoing balance of payment problems. And that is where International Monetary Fund comes in now by number 12. So now we can acknowledge 
to Santa Claus for your correct answer. St. Andrews, thank you for your correct answer. Buren as well. I'm F, but remember, when it comes to uh, question 1.3, we're not allowed to write uh, abbreviations, abbreviations, so uh, we should rather uh, be able to write it out in full so that we do not get penalized at the end of the year or um, trial exams in terms of the marking. So we, of course, want you to write it out full. Right, number 13, the exchange of goods or services across international borders. Very easy, international trade. And let's see who got it correct. Um, St. Andrews, international trade, well done. Um, in Kulungwe, CISWE, secondary says globalization. Um, globalization has more to do with the interaction of all the world, all, all countries um, trading as one. So I would rather accept international trade as an answer. Um, yeah, so that is all that we have from the school, so all done. Thank you. Buren also says international trade if I did not recognize them. Thank you. Number 14, international transactions relating to the ownership of fixed assets. Number 14, um, St. Andrew said foreign direct investment. Num um, Buren said FDI, that's foreign direct investment as well, but number 14 has to do with capital transfer account. Remember in economics, capital um, relates to fixed assets. So that is your keyword, I would say. Number 15, a situation where one country has a relative advantage um, in the production of goods and services. Now number one and number 15, links because number links because by number one that is where one country basically produces cheaper and then by number 15 um it is where one country has as advantage in the production process um then the other country and that is comparative advantage so let's see who got the answer correct because i saw quite a few correct answers earlier on Um, St. Andrew's Comparative, I see you. Um, Buren and Inko Luisizi say specialization. And for Santa Kral, but it is um, comparative advantage. Right. Number 16. Records, records in the national transaction relating to production, income, and expenditure. Uh, for Santa Kral and Purances, current account. And Andrews says current account. And you're all correct. Well done. Um, number 17, money that enters the country is offset against money that leaves the country. Here should be country, here with the C is missing, so please add country um, in your notes. And for Santa Claus, Buren says injection, in Cesar also says injection. Um, just looking at all the other answers, it is net 
balance. Repeat of number 16. Number 16 is current account. And number 17 is net balance. Number 18, um, make provision for omissions. Could you repeat the on could you repeat the answer of number 16? Number 16 is current account. Right, we are by number 18 now. Um, make provision for omissions. So when you look in your balance of payments, um, basically a part where we do not record um, or we forgot to record things and that would be by our unrecorded transactions. That's by number 18. Then by number 19, um, money received without any productive services rendered, for example, gifts. Um, what is that known as for number 19? Number 18 is unrecorded. Thank you, Craven B. Number 19, we are busy with that one now. So number 19 would be transfer payments. And then number 20. Number 20, we buy and sell equities and debt securities, for example, shares and bonds. So where do we go to buy that or what would that be known as? That would be known as your portfolio investments, also known as hot money. So that is um, macroeconomics. Yes, uh, JSE would be a platform where you could um, go and trade or go and buy and sell your equities. Thank you so much. So now, so far we have done um, all four topics and the concepts relating to um, macroeconomics. Kretovs, please use this to study. This is an additional resource that was created by the um, economics department. So please um, use it as a resource when studying. So then you are not overwhelmed and also study well in advance. Do not study these concepts of the day or the hour before you write. Um, in order to uh, achieve success, you must put in the hard work and by, by you being present here today, that's also a part of the hard work. So we are now so far, we are done with um, microeconomics. So I'm going to move over to um, macroeconomics. And this is basically the topic that you completed in term two. Um, whatever we do not get to complete today, we will um, continue with on Thursday. So please ensure that you have this. So we're going to go over some multiple choice questions now in your notebook. Um, so this is normally the first question that you get to see in section A when you open your question paper. And um, it is very important to read the instructions by now. You all know the instructions because it's asked every time or given every time. Several options are given as possible answers to the following questions. Choose the answer. Um, and for example, write down the letter. A to D next to the question number. There they give it to you, they also tell you how to do it. But sometimes you give more than one answer and that is incorrect. So, um, the first question is 1.1.1, an example of variable cost item is. So, in order for you to understand or give an answer, you need to know what is a variable cost. So, variable cost changes as production changes. So life cover, we eliminate that. Insurance, that is a fixed amount you pay. Rent is also a fixed amount. So that, um, therefore, the answer would be A. And thank you to Inko Resizwe for your answer. I do see your answer on here. Thank you. 
Then number 1.1.2, the slope of the demand curve of an individual firm under perfect market conditions is vertical, is horizontal, um, trending downwards from left to right, and is positive, right? So in order for you to um, remember this, I just want to show you something quickly. So remember, this would be your vertical side. This is where your price would be. And then on this side, you have your quantity. But now they ask you the slope of the demand curve. So it, the demand curve, is it vertical? That is A's option. No, it's not. Is it horizontal? Yes, it is. So therefore, your answer is B. Um, so therefore, your answer is B. Then, moving on, 1.1.3. So, um, I just need to acknowledge the schools that quickly gave the answers. I do apologize. So, 1.2, Buren said B, correct. In is a B, that's correct. Um, now, we are moving on to number three. To avoid closure, the perfect competitor must be able to cover the cost. So what cost? A is average variable cost. B is average cost. C is labor cost. D is um, fixed cost. And your answer there would be power high is correct and that is A um, which is your average variable cost. Then 1.1.4 Unit costs are also known as cost. So is it marginal cost? Marginal cost is basically the additional cost that you incur. So that is no. Is it total cost? Total cost has to do with your fixed cost plus your variable cost. So that is not that. Uh, average cost and then variable cost. So let's see what the answer is here. 1.1.4 um, is... One point one point four in Colossus it says B. No, it is not B because remember I just said now total cost would be your fixed cost plus your variable cost. Thank you, Bahai. It is C. Then one point one point five. The long term refers to a period where factors of production may change. So is it A both? Variable and fixed, only variable, which is B. C is only fixed and D is floating. So um, let's see what are your answers. But R says A, Inclusive says C, Buren says A, Buren and Baha, you are correct. Well done. All right. 1.1.6. A fresh produce market is a good example of a market structure. Is it, so is it a monopolistic comp competition? B, monopoly, C, perfect, and in D, oligopoly. So let's see what your answers are. Bar, I say C, Buren say C, you are correct. Um, teachers, please just number it. So um, Because I do see uh, inclusive, you said C, but I don't know for what question that was. So could you please just number your um, answers as well? It's going to make it very easy when it comes to acknowledging you. Your school, sorry. Then moving on to 1.1.7. An individual firm under perfect competition has a demand curve. So is it perfect elastic, perfect inelastic, relatively elastic or relatively inelastic? So let's look at the answer. One Number seven, power I says A and no one else gave an answer for number seven yet. The seven, power I, you're correct. Well done.
Then number eight, one point one point eight, the slope of the supply curve for the individual firm under perfect competition is. A negative, B positive, C horizontal, and then D vertical. Let's look at your options here. Oh, I said B for number eight. And boys, the only person in a school that gave an answer so far. And it is B. Well done. Well, I. Then 1.1.9, an industry with only two producers controlling the market is known as A, A, duopoly, B, monopoly, C, oligopoly, D, triopoly. So let's see. Um, 1.10 by I says B, includes C, Z, 1.7 said C. No. Um, then we are by 1.9 now, just looking 1.9 A, that is correct, inclusive Z, Buren, that is correct. A, it is to operate. So it's when two firms control the market. Then 1.1.10, pricing for the individual business on the perfect market is determined by the owner market dominant business or the business so remember in, when you're in the perfect market you are one of the characteristics is that you are a price taker so who sets the price basically um the prices are set by the market the owner cannot decide what the price will be because remember the owner is a price taker the dominant business can also not because that same business is a price taker as well and the business can't either so therefore the answer would be b and um buren gave that answer well done just trying to bow also gave the answer well done That's all. So, since our time is up, I'm going to leave the matching items for Thursday morning. Um, so, that's all from my side. Um, the attendance register was posted, as well as the feedback form in the chat. So, teachers, please um, fill both of those in. Um, so, that's all from my side. And